and he joined UCLA last year after finishing her his sorry after finishing his master's degree in the computational biology and biostatistics program at Harvard School of Public Health. And before that, he was an undergraduate student in Fudan University in China. During his undergrad study, he focused on evolutionary biology. And then since his master's, he, he switched to statistical genomics. And Dongyang is a very talented and productive student. So today he's going to talk about his first project, com almost completed in my group. It's about the detection of a differentially expressed genes on long cell pseudotime from single cell RNA seq data. So please take it from here, Dong Yuan. Thanks, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Dong Yuan, and today I will talk about the newly proposed method pseudotime DE, which is a method for detecting differential expressed genes and generate valid p values for single cell RNA seq sequencing data. So here is some very basic background. I guess all you know something about single cell technology, so I will skip these parts. So basically, single cell RNA-seq just try to measure the transcriptomes at the single cell level. So compared to bulk RNA-seq, which you actually measure the expression average on each cell, single cell is an individual measure of the expression level. So the most important question is what is pseudotime? So pseudotime is a latent temporal variable um, which drives the gradual transcriptional changes of the expression profiles. So pseudotime inference, or we can call it trajectory inference, is basically try to ordering cells along a trajectory or lineage based on their similarities of expression profiles. This may sound too abstract, so I will use the um, most popular pseudotime inference package seen short as an example of how pseudotime works. So here is a illustration figure of the seen short algorithm. So you can see in the first step, we try to lay out the cells on a 2D dimension reduction representation of the expression profiles. And then we perform clustering and connect the clusters based on some algorithm, for example, minimum spanning tree, and then use smoothing curves to smooth the tree. And eventually you project the cells onto the smoothing curve. So basically here from the left side, you have the zero through time and to the right side, you have the largest through time. And each cell through time is the distance from this um, start node to the position it's project to the uh, it was project to the smooth curve. So here is a real data example. So we have seven different uh, cell types, and we can see after the through time construction, we actually connect the cells um, using a smoothing curve, and we can see from the HBC the cells differentiate into many different cell types, and each lineage represents one pseudo time lineage. So this is the basic idea about pseudo time. So it measures like the um, continuous change of the cell states uh, in contrast to the discrete of the different cell types. So one natural question is that we may be interested in genes differentially oppressed along the pseudo time, or we can simply call them DE genes. So this can be very important because those genes may play a very important role in the cellular responses. For example, like here, the DE gene CCL5 is a very important immune gene. And we can see like this is CCL5 shows like an increasing expression pattern along the through time, which means that there are some immune responses process. <clears throat> so for this questions, there are some different methods for detecting DE genes along through the time. For example, treat seq and monocost 3 are the two state-of-art methods. So almost all current methods rely on regression framework. So I will use the simplest case to explain this. For example, if here yig is the expression value of cell i in gene j, and we can just treat it as a linear function of the pseudotime xi. And here is a um, epsilon ij, which measures the uh, error, random error from yij. So the limitation of such kind of work is that x is fixed in regression framework, but pseudotime is random. 
what does that mean? So here you can see this random error epsilon ij comes from yij, but instead actually xi also contains some randomness because the through time is not observed if it's inferred from the data. So this ignorance of the uncertainty can result in many different consequences, for example, invalid p-values. So our new method through time B is definitely is actually try to solve this problem, which can take into account the uncertainty of the x render x value and also generate the valid p values. So here is our method. This is a very brief illustration figure of how through time in uh, how through time D works. So here our input data is an um, extraction matrix of the cells. And then we perform through time inference to and perform the regression model to generate a test statistics. But the most important question is how can we get the uncertainty of through time? So we use the subsampling methods. We subsample cells into many different sets and then we perform the through time inference using the exactly same procedure as we did on the original data. And we get the through time of each subsample. And after that, we permute the cells, which means that we break the relationship between each cell and uh, its through time. So we construct 100% uh, non cases by this permutation. And then we also fit the same regression model and generate the test statistics, which represents a non distribution of the test statistics. And combine these two parts, we generate the p value of j and j. So here is some very basic mathematical notation. So y i j represents an n by m gene expression matrix, and n is cells and m is genes. And here we also have the through time vector, which is the same length as the number of cells. And to estimate uncertainty of through time, we subsample 80% of cells uh, for b times, and default is 1,000 times. And then we get the subsamples of each, um, or we get the subsamples and represent as YB. And on each YB, we also generate the pseudo time we denote as T1 to TB. And here is our regression model. So I will skip the um, theoretical part of the generalized additive model theory and just show the model. And the first model is negative binomial GAM model, which we assume that Y follows negative binomial distribution. And the mean expression level is a smooth function of the through time. And to incorporate the potential zero inflation problem, we also use the zero inflated negative binomial GAM model, which we introduce a hidden variable. So if the hidden variable is zero, then yij follows the same negative binomial distribution. But if it is one, then it represents that this value is a dropout. So we still assume the mean expression level is a smooth function of ti and the, the probability of dropout follows the logistic function of the mean extraction value on log scale. So this is observed in many different researches. And here, fj is actually a cubic spline function. So it can accommodate any arbitrary shapes of the trajectory. So our hypothesis is very simple. We want to test if the smooth function fj is, a constant, is constantly zero for any ti. And we use the similar word like test statistics and uh, it's actually like um, the, you can just treat as the square of fj and divide it by the variance. And also we perform the permutation test to generate the um, test statistics based on our previous uh, procedure. And uh, it actually can be treated as a non-values of the test statistics fj. So for the p-value calculation, the most intuitive way is just following the um, traditional permutation test. So here the PJ empirical is just like you count how many SJ from the non cases is larger than your test statistics in the original data and divided by the total number. So the problem of this 
procedure is that the resolution is very limited. For example, if you have 1,000 subsamples, and then eventually the smallest p-value is just a 0.001. So this is definitely not enough. For example, if you want to perform an FDR control on a very strict level, or you want to choose the top 100 DE genes, and this is not enough because you will get a lot of ties. So to solve this problem and to achieve like arbitrary resolution level, we use a parametric fit, uh, which we perform like a gamma distribution or a two component gamma mixture to fit the test non-test statistics. And then we use a likelihood ratio test to choose the best fit as F hat J. And the parametric p-value is just from the fitted non-distribution. So this approach solves the problem that we have like a limited resolution of p-values. And it is very useful in our practice. So for the experimental design to make sure that our method is generalizable for different through time inference methods, we choose different two different methods, slingshot and monocost three to perform through time inference. And our main competitor will be treat seek and monocost three, two single cell DE methods. And we also compare some block RNA seq DE methods, which is developed for time series data. And we generate four different synthetic data sets in total, and also three real world single cell data sets. So here's the result part. <clears throat> so in this figure, we show how through time DE captures uncertainty of the through time using the simulation data. So here, figure A and C are two visualization of the fitted through time by slingshot and the monocost three. And B represents the distribution of the through time from the subsamples procedure. So here in B, each line represents one individual cell and we lay out the distribution of the inferred through time along zero to one. And we can see like there's a clear spreadness of the inferred through time, which means that the through time is uncertain across different subsamples. And if we recheck the A and C, we can see like C using uh, it's used, uh, C uses U map algorithm, which is random. And also the fitting curve is much more weakness compared to A. So the through time uncertainty is naturally higher than B. So, this is, uh, um, sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I don't know if it's okay to ask questions during the middle here, but so in the, in the slingshot example, I mean, it seems to me that when you subsample these uh, 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 data sets, the primary source of error for this synthetic data, if you're doing a good job of capturing the, the pseudo time will be the fact that if I'm a cell and I'm uh, my, my next cell, the cell that's next to me in the simulation of the pseudo time that generated the data is gone. It's, it's not in the subsample. Then I'm going to move forward relatively in the pseudo time inference. Is that the source of the error here in, because the synthetic data, I know a little bit about how it's generated. It sort of smoothly varies some set of variables across a real pseudo time um, uh, at least the ones we played with. So I'm just curious if that's the source of the error in the estimates that you're getting in B. If basically the point is that I'm missing, I'm moving around in the, in the pseudo time inference because some cells just aren't there or if there's more error there. Does that oh, make I see. Yeah, mm, I think this is a very good question. So here actually I, I think this is not very important. Uh, it's not very severe problem because we normalize the uh, through time into zero to one scale. So which means that even though you delay some cells, we should treat them on roughly the same scale. Um, do you think this is okay for, for you? Yeah, no, I, 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 think, I think that might be, I think there might be multiple sources of why it would vary. I think still, if you're dividing by the total length of the pseudo time, the fact that let's say I've, I've lost randomly a couple of cells ahead of me, um, you know, I might move a little forward relative to the total length of the pseudo time, just because randomly five cells ahead of me got, got deleted. 
um, uh, in that particular example. But it probably, yeah, it may not be a, a, a big a big deal. Um, uh, but it might be cool to understand where where the variation is coming from. If it's not that, what what actually generates this uncertainty here? Um, uh, is it just slingshot is bad at this, or or what what um, what actually is happening? Yeah, I see. Yeah. Definitely two layers of randomness. One is sampling randomness. That's why we're using subsampling, right? We, we think the cells only represent a random subsample from the cell population. And we're using subsampling to capture that level of randomness. And what we did is we only subsample, we have subsample 80% of the cells. And this is to make sure that the subsample size is not too much smaller than the original sample size. And the second layer of randomness is of of course, the algorithm. The, the algorithm may do different things. And we have seen that the randomness of slingshot is much smaller than the randomness of Monaco 3. Yeah, exactly. You see a very yeah. big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's very yeah. cool. I was just trying to, I was just trying to understand. Yeah. Please go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I understand your question. I think the best case is that we can generate the same number of cells Mm, but this is not mm, very easy to do because if you use bootstrapping, actually you will get even worse results because you have many exactly same cells on your pseudo time scale. Yeah, very cool. Mm, yeah, so we can consider like if we have better solution in future. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, and also on the topology scale, scale we see like there's a um, lot of randomness. For example, on the original data, we generate a bifurcation topology, but on 10 random subsamples, four of them fail to generate a bifurcation topology, which means that there's a lot of ignoring randomness and uncertainty for the through time inference algorithms. And we should keep an eye on this. And here is our result, how to, to show like through time inference, uh, through time DE generate well calibrated p values. So since we use the simulation data, we have 100% uh, um, sure non cases. And we know that p values under the null should follow an uniform distribution from zero to one. And here we compare the through time D to four different other methods. And we can see only through time DE follows exactly the uh, expected um, uniform distribution under the now. And the second best case is Monaco 3, but we can still see like uh, there's um, deviation from the diagonal line. And for the other three methods, tree seek, NBM seek, and impulse D to zero p value are just completely off from the expected um, distribution. And if this is not very intuitive, we can just check the histogram and we can see tree stick and impulse D2, they show like um, bimodal distribution, which means that they also have some two small p-value and two large p-values. And NBM stick just show like a lot of two small p-values. So is this really, does this really matter in our analysis? Uh, yes, this is very important. And we, we plot the p-values under the log 10, negative log 10 scale because usually small p-values are more important for our downstream analysis. And we can see only through time DE generate p-values closest to the um, diagonal line. And all the other methods, they show like um, two small p-values compared to the expected p-values. And this results the uh, fear of at FDR control because for the, like for example, Benjamin Hodgeberg procedure, you need to have valid p-value under the node to make sure the procedure can succeed. And we can see like here, so time D generates the best FDR, FDR control, which is very close to the, very close to the normal 0.05 level, where all the other methods, they fail to control the FDR which means that you can see like the valid p-value is very important for downstream analysis. And on the other hand, we can compare the power of different algorithms because um, on the, the valid p-values does not uh, result in higher power. Um, so here on the left panel, we show the ROC curve compared with different methods. And we can see like so time D generates the highest uh, AUROC, which means that it has the uh, best ability to distinguish the non-cases and the alternative cases. 
And since the um, FDR control does not work for other methods, so we use the observed FDP as a cutoff to make a fair comparison of the power of different algorithms. And we can see through time D also achieves the highest power. And we should focus, uh, we should notice here like on the AOLC level, so time D, treat stick and NDM stick, they generate like very similar AOLC values because they you all use the ND GAN model. So their models are similar, but the differences in their p-value calculation makes their uh, power and uh, also the FDR control show very different results. And here is a real ex data example one. So this is a dendritic cell simulated with LPS and we show how the results look like. Um, because NBM seek and the impulse D to show very bad results in simulation, so we just do not use it on real data anymore. And we can see here on trade seek, there's a clear invalid p-value speech because we should not expect that there's a peak for the non-cases. And also when we compare the the genes, we should see like a very significant differences between different algorithms. So in order to compare the, which method generates most biologically meaningful DE genes, we perform the goal analysis on the pairwise comparison of the method specific DE genes. And we can see through time D always generates the largest number of significant goal terms which means that a lot of um, Go terms are enriched in so time specific D specific DE genes um, compared to other DE methods. And if we further check those significant Go terms, we can actually see a lot of um, very biologically meaningful term. For example, here's some term about uh, inflammatory response and the cell response to LPS. Remember that this experiment measures cells stimulated with LPS. So this show like very strong evidence that through time DE can discover some DE genes which are missed by other algorithms, but are very important for the underlying biological process. And similar, we also performed this on the pancreatic beta cell maturation data sets. And we just observe like a very similar results. Uh, like here we show more go, uh, significant goal terms. And also these goal terms are enriched in some um, biological process of the beta cell maturation. And also we have two genes. The first one is a known DE genes and the second one is a known on DE genes. And we can see through time D generates like um, very small p-values on the DE genes, but uh, largest p-value on the non-DE genes compared to other methods. And in the last real data example, we use the bone marrow differentiation example. So here on the original data, we can see like the data that constructs like a bifurcation topology, but on subsamples, we can see there's a lot of trifurcation topology. And this trifurcation topology is actually also biologically meaningful because it is reported in previous research uh, about a specific cell type consists of this third um, lineage. Um, but to make a fair comparison compared to other methods, we just use uh, two lineages. And eventually we also, because the D genes shows very similar patterns across different methods. Here we use GSEA instead. And we can see through time DE and uh, generates usually higher number of uh, significant enriched gene sets. And the uh, sick generates a very limited number of enriched gene sets. So we should notice that sick and through time DE actually shows a very large overlapping between each other almost 80% of the genes are similar. But since their p-value calculation are different, so you can see they lead to significantly different results on the GSVA, which means that we should not only consider the rank of the genes, but the p-values is also very, import also very important for downstream analysis. 
And another interesting question is, should we use zero inflated models? Because previous mm. models are all based on negative binomial model. And here I plot the fitted by the fitted curve by negative binomial and zero inflated negative binomial. So we actually observe a very interesting phenomenon that using DINB model does not show better performance than NB. The problem is that we cannot distinguish non-biological zeros from biological zeros. So for example, here are a lot of zero values, but if you just simply use the NB model, you may explain them as uh, dropout events. So based on our results, we suggest that usually people should just use NB model because those two complicated model may generate overfitting of the data. So based on the Pazimonius uh, rule, I think uh, ND is usually better than DINB. But users can choose to use DINB if they want or perform the, compare the AIC values to choose which model fits the data better. So here's the acknowledgement. Uh, first, I want to thank the, my advisor, Professor Jin Yi Li. Uh, for his uh, for her mentoring of this project, and also we undergraduate in our lab. Uh, he does a lot of work on the simulation, and also all other lab members. And also want to thank the help from um, Professor Alexander Hoffman and uh, Catherine Shu in their helpness of uh, in their help of the analysis of the dendritic cells stimulated to LPS because I'm not an expert in immunology. Thanks, and any more questions about this?